Welcome to the History of Christianity podcast with Stephen Bedard. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash hopesreason. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So in this episode... I have Roman Montero sharing all the way from beautiful Norway, and glad to have you on the podcast, Roman. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and especially your research interests. Yeah, well, I'm uh, I'm not an academic, but I've been uh, studying the New Testament for for many years now, and I've been getting into the background of the New Testament and the history of early Christianity. And originally what got me into it was reading through Acts and reading those two passages in Acts 2, 42 to 47 and 4, 32 to 37. And those passages sort of fascinated me because they sort of, they really stood out and they seemed to be describing something radical. But then when I went to the commentaries and uh, looked at the different uh, scholarly work, on those passages, I didn't really find anything satisfying. They seemed to not really know what to make of those passages. And so then I ended up just doing my own research and eventually ended up with the book, All Things in Common. Uh, now, what I'm doing these days is I've been working on a, a project on the Sermon on the Plain. And I've basically been doing a similar thing that I did with the passages in Acts 2 and 4, but with the whole Sermon on the Plain, namely looking at them through the eyes of uh, sociology and uh, anthropology and trying to you know, get to the bottom of them and, and al- analyze them and see what can be made of, of those passages. Uh, so that's what I'm working on now, and you know, who knows when that will be done. It's a, that's quite a big project, as I've been finding out. I find it interesting you're focusing on the Sermon on the Plain rather than the uh, the more popular Sermon on the Mount. I was just curious as to what drew you to, uh, to Luke's version of it. Well, a couple of things. Well, the Sermon on the Mount has been studied by many, many, many different scholars. And it's been – there's a lot of uh, books written on the Sermon on the Mount. There's been a lot of work on it. The Sermon on the Plain is received a lot less attention. And uh, I find it actually a lot more interesting. If the uh, Q theorists uh, are to be believed, then actually the Sermon on the Plain is closer to the original. When you look at the reconstructions of Q, which is the uh, hypothetical uh, sayings gospel that was used by both Matthew and Luke, well, according to the reconstructions, Luke's version is actually closer to, to the original. And also, I find uh, Luke's version to, to be a lot more um, extreme. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but it seems like a lot more radical and um, a lot more focused around things like social justice. And you see that right in the very beginning uh, with the Beatitudes, whereas Matthew kind of spiritualizes the Beatitudes of things. Luke's is purely about social class. It's the rich the poor, the hungry and the full. And then when you go into the ethics portion, he talks about lending without expecting anything in return. He talks about giving uh, to anyone who asks. And I think very often people will read those commands and take them as hyperbole, uh, that Jesus is sort of making a kind of over-the-top demand of his followers. But as I've been doing research, I found that I, I... I don't think that's actually the case. So, for example, when it talks about lending without expecting re- a return, I think if you, you look back to the, uh, uh, the Jewish laws of lending and you look to things like, for example, the sabbatical year and the jubilee uh, where the debts were to be canceled, and you use that as the framework, for example, the, the sabbatical law where the debts are supposed to be released at the seventh year, then – and later on in that in that text in Deuteronomy, it says that uh, you should open your hand out to the needy one and, and you should lend freely, not thinking to yourself that, well, the sabbatical year is going to come. I'm going to 
have to release the debt so I won't lend, the command is to lend anyway. And I think if you use that framework and you look at what Jesus is saying, it makes a lot more sense. He's saying to follow the sabbatical law and lend without expecting a return. And if he is waiting for you know, the Jubilee, as is indicated in actually his Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, when he's at the synagogue and he talks about, he quotes Isaiah 61, talking about the good year, which is a reference to the Jubilee. And that's a big part of his message, is the Jubilee. And when I looked at that, I also compared what Jesus said uh, with some of the rabbinic literature and how they view the lending. Uh, so, for example, Rabbi Hillel, he interprets the lending laws a little differently. So he says that, for example, when you're going to lend your neighbor a bread, uh, and this is in the Mishnah, when you're, you're going to lend your neighbor a bread, you should calculate the cost of the bread. Because let's say the cost goes up or down when she's going to give you a loaf of bread back. Well, then one of you has committed usury. So he's thinking of those lending laws, the usury laws, in terms of no one getting a profit over each other. Whereas in the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus says that you should that you should lend without expecting a return. And then he talks about that you will get back without measure. That it will be, I forget the actual wording, but it's like pressed down and overflowing. And the way I've been kind of looking at that is that Jesus is interpreting the anti-usury laws, not so much as that you should have an equal amount, but that the the lending should be done for the sake of your fellow Israelites and not taking advantage of them and lending to them without measuring, without keeping an account of what's been lent out. And with things like the sabbatical law and the jubilee, it kind of makes you know, measuring out uh, how much you've lent out kind of pointless if the debts are going to be released anyway. So that's just, you know, I could go on forever talking about this, but uh, when I've been doing the research on the Sermon on the Plain, I've, I've found that there's a lot more there uh, than meets the eye. And looking at that sermon with the, the overall Jewish background, the rabbinic background that Jesus found himself in, a lot more sense can be made of it than just saying that Jesus, you know, giving uh, hy hyperbolic uh, commands. So <laughs> it's a kind of a long answer, but uh, that's why I'm focusing more on the Sermon on the Plain. No, that's that's really good. And, and Luke has been an area of my research as well. So I'll be looking forward to, to reading that when you uh, when you get that finished. Finished. Now you do have a, a book out called All Things in Common. And how would you summarize the the central thesis of that book? Well, basically, that the passages in Acts 2, 42 to 47, and 4, 32 to 37, which are known uh, often as the, the so-called communism of the apostles. It says they uh, held all things in common. Not one of them was in need, but they sold lands and uh, distributed according to who had need. That these passages describe a practice that was historical, that it actually happened, and it was widespread. So a, a lot of the commentators will say that this practice, if it happened, was just in Jerusalem. But there's actually a lot of evidence that this practice was not just in Jerusalem, that in all over, spread out throughout the Roman Empire. And uh, there's evidence of that in some of the Pauline letters. Uh, there's evidence in uh, the Didache and the Epistle of Barnabas, and then later documents such as the Apologies of Tertullian and Justin Martyr, and even actually writings by the uh, Roman poet Lucian, uh, who wrote a, a story against uh, the Christians. So there's a lot of evidence that this was not just in Jerusalem, that it was widespread, and that it didn't last just for a short time that it actually lasted well into the second century and beyond. And I find that I found that interesting studying this because a lot of the commentators and a lot of the um, historians sort of portray those verses as just describing a sort of flash in the flash in the pan. That it 
started in Jerusalem and then faded away. And I, I think that I think that that's wrong. I think that there's a lot of evidence out there that it was it was widespread. Uh, another thesis that I have is that the best way to understand to reconstruct these practices is not using an economic framework or a political framework, but rather a uh, anthropological framework. And I use the framework of a anthropologist by the name of David Graeber, and he divides all kinds of human relationships, of social relationships, into three basic forms. And those are hierarchy, exchange, and communism. And these basic forms of social relationships describe the moral underpinnings of how people relate to each other. And these categories would apply to any society. So uh, even tribal societies where there is no state, there is no formal government, these would apply, and they apply even today. So hierarchy is pretty straightforward. It's just there's someone superior, someone inferior. The superior one makes the rules. The inferior one is expected to follow the rules. And the superior party gets to decide on basically how the relationship goes. So there's there's a hierarchy, and it's a ongoing relationship. Exchange is tit for tat. It's a quid pro, quid pro quo kind of relationship. So that's the underpinnings of, of a modern market society. It's the idea that people relate to each other contractually. So for a short-term basis where one person is supposed to give something, the other person gives something, and they're supposed to be relatively equal. And the assumption here is that the individuals involved are equals and that they exchange contractually. And so this is the basic kind of underpinning ideology of capitalism, whereas, for example, hierarchy was the basic underpinning of feudalism, that that was the assumption of how things run. Communism is basically from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So that sort of relationship is where people are expected to give what they can, to do what they can for whatever is needed. And whoever has the need is going to receive the need. And so this can be on a small scale. So, for example, if you're on the street and you're lost and you ask someone for directions, Usually, the assumption is in that specific case, communism. The guy's going to help you because you have a need and he has an ability. And it can go to, to higher levels. So, for example, when a group of friends work on a project together or when people go on a vacation together or people go to a cabin trip or whatever, everyone's expected to pitch in and they're expected to take what they need. And... This, for example, would be the underpinnings of certain like monasteries, uh, monastic orders, where there's a formal kind of communism. And it would also be the underpinnings, say, of uh, concepts like social security, the idea that everyone should help each other, help each other out. And in my uh, book, for the purposes of my book, I split up communism to two different forms. Uh, one is formal communism. And that's where these relationships are enforced by rules, uh, formal rules. So that would be, for example, in a monastery where there are certain rules about who does what and uh, that to make sure that relationship stays in place. And then there's informal communism, which is just a sort of spontaneous arising of these kind of relationships. So that would be, for example, when a disaster breaks out in the city. Usually people will just spontaneously go out and, and help each other. They'll find out who needs what, and people are expected to come to each other's aid. And that's informal communism, because it's not uh, enforced by any formal rules, just the moral underpinnings of society. So when I examine those passages and uh, using that framework, I, I kind of reconstruct it. And one way I reconstruct it is by comparing it to another group 
very similar to the early Christians, the Essenes, who are descri described very similarly uh, by both Josephus, a Jewish historian, and Philo of Alexandria. And they both describe this group using very similar language. And what's interesting is the language that they use, the phrase, all things in common, is actually, it's not a uh, phrase found in the Jewish tradition. It's not in the, the Hebrew Bible or the Septuagint. It comes from the Greek tradition, the Greek philosophical tradition. And that phrase, in Greek it's pantakoina, is used by Plato, it's used by uh, Aristotle, it's used by um, Seneca in his writings, by all these different philosophers, and it's used to describe the perfect form of friendship, which is that friends should hold all things in common, that they should share with each other. So Philo and Josephus, when talking about the Essenes, they use this phrase. They use this phrase, Pontacoina, all things in common. And so does Luke. And they're all writing for a Hellenistic audience, so they're using that language. But luckily with the Essenes, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which many scholars ascribe to the Essenes or to a Essene-like group. And so in that instance, we can see sort of what they wrote about themselves and how they organized themselves, because we have two documents in particular, the uh, Damascus document and the community rule document that describe how they organize themselves. And so I kind of reconstruct the Essenes first and then use that, a mo as, use that as a model to reconstruct the way the Christians organize themselves. And basically my conclusion is, is that there were two aspects to how the Christians organized themselves. There was an informal communism, which was enforced by the ethical teachings of Jesus and the apostles, and that this informal communism was very, very strong. We see in Justin Martyr, he describes holding all things in common along with things like avoiding fornication or avoiding idolatry. So it was a very strong moral underpinning to this. So this was the informal communism, the idea that the Christians should share with one another. And it got to the point to where both Luke in Acts 4 and uh, elsewhere, such as in Justin Mortar and uh, the Epistle of Barnabas, could say that they don't consider anything their own, that it was as if there was no private property, uh, even though what was happening was not a change of property arrangements necessarily, because obviously the early Christians, they weren't a government and they didn't have the authority to change property arrangements. And we do know from other scriptures that there was, that Christians did have their own property. We see that in, for example, Acts 5 and the Pauline letters that people had their own property and they weren't compelled to, to give it up in that sense, or they weren't uh, forced by threat of any violence to give it up. But the moral pressure was strong enough to where it was as if there was no property. The other aspect of it was the formal communism, and that took the form of a collection of goods, of money, and a distribution. And this was also a, done at a very high scale. It was enough to where uh, widows were getting regular meals were getting uh, taken care of by the Christian community. And it was actually to the point to where people uh, would actually give up, <laughs> families would give up taking care of their, their, the widows in their family because the Christian community was doing so. And in fact, to where some people actually would try and defraud the Christian community. So for example, there's an example in, in Lucian of Guy called Proteus in the second century, who would go around, would go around to the different communities pretending that he was a, a Christian, sort of portraying himself as a prophet, so that he could benefit materially. So 
those were the two aspects that the phrase all things in common uh, is describing. And it's, it was a big part of the early Christians, so much so that when Lucian describes their doctrine, that's basically how he describes it. He says the Christians are people who, who hold all things in common. That's their defining mark. That's very interesting. I, I appreciate your sharing of that, uh, of your thesis. When people hear anything about communism, they automatically think about things like uh, in the Soviet Union and so on. You've already touched on that in terms of uh, formal and informal communism. But if you had to explain quickly what the difference is between this sort of early primitive uh, Christian communism and modern forms, how would you compare them? When people use the phrase communism today, what they're usually referring to is the political movements that came out of uh, Marxism. And they're talking about these political movements that are trying to take over the government and establish some sort of state socialism. And this is a, this is a political phrase. And one parallel I can use is with the phrase democracy, right? So democracy can describe a form of government. Uh, it can describe political movements. You know, there are political parties that, that use that name for themselves. But it can also describe simply a way of decision making, a, a social uh, arrangement for coming to conclusions and deciding things. It's the same thing with the phrase communism. So there's a political way that word is used, and that comes very much from the Marxist tradition. And then there's the way it's used by sociologists and anthropologists, and that's more small-c communism, which is just a, a way of arranging social relationships, a way of uh, that, that people come together and relate to each other uh, economically. So that can actually happen, like I said, like, for example, a group of friends go on a, a cabin trip together. They all pitch in some money. They uh, buy the food together, put it in the fridge. Anyone can come and take the food if they want to eat, eat some food, but it, it wouldn't be appropriate for someone to sort of take that food and put it in their backpack, bring it home with them, because in that scenario, small C communism is in place. Everyone's expected to give according to their ability and take what is according to their need. So, so that's the difference. A lot of people get a little bit confused by my use of the term communism, but in my book, I, I, give a, a chapter to breaking down what I mean by that and distinguishing it from political communism. That's very helpful. I appreciate you uh, giving that distinction. Now, how did Christian understandings of economics evolve over the first four centuries? Do we see much of a difference between the way things were in the, the first and second centuries compared to, say, the, the fourth century? It's hard to say, actually. I When I studied this, I focused mainly on the first two centuries. But I did use uh, some later sources, such as uh, I, I talked a little bit about Julian the Apostate. And he uh, was came much later. I think he was in the fourth century. And uh, he wrote letters to different people. And, and he was trying to get rid of the Christians. He wanted to reestablish paganism, the traditional Roman gods, uh, back to the empire. So he wrote letters to his uh, some of his underlings, and he complained basically about the, the economic practices of the Christians. He complained that the, the Christians were taking care of the poor, taking care of the needy, and that the uh, pagan temples weren't doing anything like that. He was saying that, well, they should do something like that to compete with the Christians. Another thing he did was he wrote a letter to one of his underlings saying that they should confiscate the property of the Christians, saying basically like, well, if they're going to not want to hold property, hold private property, well, then we can help them with that. If they uh, want to be poor to go to heaven, well, then let's, let's help them with that and take the property, uh, kind of making fun of them. So that was in the fourth century. And so we see instances of this practice is going beyond the second century. But as to why it uh, died out eventually, it's hard to say. But I, I will say this. By the time Augustine comes along, 
Augustine of Hippo, we start to get the uh, Aegean controversy, which is, are we saved by our works or just by faith alone? And uh, so there's that, that conflict. Um, and Augustine starts sort of pushing the idea that it's the uh, internal person uh, that matters. It's the, it's the heart condition, not so much what you do. And uh, he kind of took that, in, a, in my opinion, a little bit to the extreme. So, for example, in one of his sermons, he talks about, uh, I don't know the, I can't remember the exact quote, but he talks, talks about, you know, if you're beating your slave, make sure you don't have hatred in your heart when you beat him. Now, of course, you're going to have to beat him because you have to have control of your household, but don't let anger come into your heart. And so, it, and it was the same way with, with wealth. The idea came that you really have to change your economic life so much, just don't love money or just don't have a, don't let greed come into your heart. And so I, I can't say for sure because I haven't studied uh, the later centuries deeply, but uh, I get the hunch that that sort of way of thinking crept in a little bit. And, and also, I'd have to say that after uh, Constantine and then later on uh, under Theodosius when uh, Christianity became very prominent and it uh, became a way for wealthy people and the noblemen to get a little bit of actually more power, that that way of looking at the uh, economic ethics of Christianity became more popular. And then the, the idea that the idea of koinonia, which is a fellowship uh, in the original form, uh, as described in uh, Acts, kind of died away to a more spiritualized version. Uh, like I said, I can't say uh, for sure, because I haven't studied it, but one good book uh, to look at if you want to look at the later centuries is the book Through a, the Eye of a Needle by Peter Brown, where he looks at the... Uh, uh, Christian view of wealth in late antiquity. And uh, I recommend that book a lot. Well, that's good. As you were talking there, I was wondering if one of the things that might have been going on was that there was, a, over time, a sharper distinction between clergy and laity. And I'm wondering if uh, certain standards or certain ways of living out the Christian life were still expected of the clergy but the lady did not necessarily have to meet those standards. And so we see uh, certain ways that uh, priests and monks and, and others uh, were living, but lady were not expected to to meet those same standards. I don't know if you've thought about yeah, that at all. Yeah, that, that's actually a, a good point, that later on um, it, it kind of came with with the rise of monasticism. Uh, it kind of came became expected that, well, you know, uh, the laity doesn't have to live like this, but the the monks, the holy people, they will do it for us, and they can pray for us, and uh, so we can kind of get our righteousness through them, that they can pray for us, and that we can live our worldly lives, uh, but as long as the monks are doing their thing, we're okay. And uh, one thing that also happened later on is that the poor, which was in the, the Christian tradition from the beginning, is uh, the idea of, of the poor being uh, special and important, it got redefined in a sense to the, the holy poor. So it would be the, the priests or the monks, and they were the real poor, not the actually physically lower classes, but the, you'd want to give to the, the church, to the monasteries, and that would sort of earn you... Um, Brownie points. I don't mean to make make light make light of it, but that would sort of by giving them the money, since they're the the holy poor, uh, that would sort of give you a little bit of righteousness. So that a little bit of that happened as well uh, later on. Well, that's that's interesting stuff. And uh, your book, All Things in Common, sounds like a, an excellent read. I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes for this at the, the website historyofchristianitypodcast.com. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to, to share with us, Roman, before we uh, sign off? Yeah, you know, one one thing that I, I, I found very interesting was that um, originally 
the the idea of physical sharing of your goods that this uh, these economic practices were completely tied in uh, with the spiritual practices. So when Jesus' teachings is recorded in, especially uh, Luke, uh, he he uh, talks about, like I already said in, in Luke chapter 4, uh, 18-19, he talks about the Jubilee. And this is a big part of his teachings. And in the Lord's Prayer in Luke, he, he uses the term debts and sins together. He says, as you forgive the debts of others, then God will forgive your sins. Uh, the two are tied together. And in the, the Didache, uh, it says, um, in one section, it says, For if you are sharers in what is imperishable, how much more so in perishable things. So these practices of uh, communism uh, among the early Christians were tied in very strongly with their their faith and their their spiritual beliefs, uh, as well as their belief in the the eschaton, and that was um, a, a major theme, uh, not only with the Christians but also with the Essenes. In the Essene, the, the Damascus document, the same document that lays out how the Essenes were to share with one another and to uh, take in a collection for the poor, they laid out their own eschatology. So uh, these practices uh, of the early Christians were very uh, a lot more uh, real than a lot of people uh, realize. They were seen by the outside. They were noticed by the outside. And it made them different uh, from the other people in the Roman Empire, uh, so, much more so, so much so that they were even mocked uh, for their practices. And uh, I think this is something that uh, uh, when looking at the history of uh, Christianity uh, can't be downplayed, that this was a big part of Christianity in the first two centuries. Well, thank you very much, Roman. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I look forward to following your, your future work. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. Thanks a lot, Stephen. I appreciate it. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash hopesreason. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash hopesreason for your free audiobook. And please check out my website at historyofchristianitypodcast.com and find me on Facebook and on Twitter. If you would like to support this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes or consider supporting me at patreon.com slash hopesreason. Thank you, and God bless.